My name is Mario Trejo. I'm a second year MPH student in epidemiology at the University of Arizona College of Public Health. And uh, my study was based in um, uh, Lusaka, Zambia. And it's titled, Effect of HIV Status on Response to Treatment for Cases of Non-Metastatic Cervical Cancer Patients in Lusaka, Zambia. And um, so this is Zambia here. And this star here is um, where the CDH is located, the Cancer Diseases Hospital in Lusaka, which is uh, the, the capital of, of the country. So it's kind of in the middle of the, the whole country. Um, yeah. All right, so a little background on just cervical cancer in general. It's the first, fourth most common uh, cancer among women worldwide, um, second most common cancer in developing countries, and it has the highest incidence and mortality in sub-Saharan Africa. And in Zambia, uh, there's an, an annual uh, incidence rate of 58 per 100,000 and a mortality rate of 36.2 per 100,000. And uh, H HPV is um, is one of the, the primary causal agent of cervical cancer, and uh, the two primary oncogenic types of HPV are 16 and 18, and they each have a prevalence in Zambia of 21.6%. Um, HIV is a, another big issue in, um, in Zambia as well, where 20.8% uh, of reproductive age women are HIV positive, um, and it, that's an important important fact, uh, risk factor for um, cervical cancer because uh, typically women will, uh, if they get uh, infect HPV infection, they, they can clear it, but uh, HPV infected uh, individuals or HIV infected individuals are less likely to clear the disease and are about five times more likely to um, develop squamous intraepithelial neoplasia, which um, is a precursor to cervical cancer. And um, the Cancer Diseases Hospital is, is the, where, where, I was lo where I was working, and it's the only tertiary uh, cancer treatment hospital in Zambia that opened in 2006. So prior to 2006, anyone that had any type of cancer had to leave, had to leave the country to seek treatment. Um, now they, 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 they provide, um, they, they provide uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, free of charge, or at, at a shared cost, reduced price, kind of depending. It was kind of an interesting way of trying to figure out who gets it for free, who doesn't. Um, and the hospital receives approximately 500 new cervical cancer cases per year. Um, so uh, Zambia has uh, has a really robust um, uh, cervical cancer screening program um, that started back in 2006 by the Center of Infectious, for Infectious Disease Research in Zambia, also known as CIDRS. And um, it's, it's grown over the last couple of years. Originally, uh, in 2006, it started with just screening HIV positive women. And then over, then after, uh, about, after about a year or so, they, uh, they formed a partnership with the Ministry of Health and they started uh, screening for all women. And they now have, I, I believe, around 50 sites throughout the country. And they've screened uh, about 277,000 women since as of, uh, I think that was 2016, the end of 2016. And, um, they, they're thinking that it's, it's a very effective program because 33% of the cervical cancer cases that, that arrive at, um, at the CDH are stage 1 and 2, which is pretty high for, for the region for catching uh, uh, cervical cancer. And um, though w one, one thing that um, they're not too sure about is that they're, they're not keeping track of the, of the people that get the screening. So... The CDH doesn't know, like the the women that arrive with cancer with cervical cancer, they they don't have any idea of knowing, like they, they were referred from a screening site or they they got the screening, so they're not exactly sure how many are actually the ones are, are actually from the screening sites, but they're, they're, that's what they're attributing the higher percentage of um, of early stage cervical cancer to, and. Uh, so I'm not the first uh, student to go to uh, Zambia. Uh, there was a previous student, I think it was back in 2013, Muleme, and uh, his study was uh, observed and expected incidence of cervical cancer in the Saka and southern western provinces in Zambia. And uh, he did, uh, so basically he was calculating um, observed and expected incidence uh, between 2007 and 2012. And I used his, uh, his data to identify my cases um, at the hospital, so I, I use that to help find my um, my early stage cervical cancer patients there. And um, he 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 went through and looked at all the the records, and that's how he got all of the cases um, at the CDH during this time. And so, 
I, I did a retrospective case case study uh, to measure the effect of HIV status on response to treatment for cases of non-metastatic cervical cancer, specifically stages 1 and 2, at the CDH between 2008 and 2012. And the reason I did 2008 to 2012 and not 7 to 2012, like Mulele did, is um, uh, they started collecting a lot of this data in 2007, so 2000, 2008 was the first complete year, and um, he, had, he only had data up until 2012, and so I, 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 I did that, and then that's also allowed for five-year follow-up, for at least five-year follow-up for these patients. Um, so using his data, I was able to identify 828, uh, stages one, cervical cancer stages one and two, and um, of those 828, 577 of them, 577 of them had known HIV status. So we knew they were positive or negative, and 251 were unknown. So um, I was I, I was trying to figure out how how to handle those unknowns, um, and I'll, I'll go into kind of what I did with that. Um, so this is kind of my inclusion criteria. I'm sorry, it's so small. But uh, basically what it is, it's, uh, there was 2,451 cases of cervical cancer at the CDH between 2008 and 2012. I excluded any cases that had unknown FIGO stage or stages 3 and 4. Uh, so that leaves 828 known FIGO stage 1 and 2, 577 with known, uh, known HIV status, 251 without. So what I did with the unknowns is I... I, I had the, some of their information, some of their information from the previous study: their uh, name, um, age, date of birth, uh, their their um, district, province, and so I used that information to uh, check with the uh, national HIV database. And so I ran queries to try and see if I can find some of these unknowns, uh, see if they, I could find them as known positives or known negatives in the HIV database. Uh, using those identif identifiers, and then any that I did find to be um, HIV positive or negative, I included in my final study population, and any that were unknown, even after checking with that database, I excluded. And so uh, then uh, I'm still working on some of the the, the link, the matching, so I, I have uh, this portion still in, in the in process. Um, so uh, I abstracted all of the records myself, um, so it was very long days, seven days a week of pulling out records, and um, I, I would go through every page of the medical record because there was a lot of lack of consistency in the way that, that, the, that the oncologist would write things. So like sometimes the HIV status was on the front page, sometimes it was the third page, sometimes, like, sometimes it was the 30th page, and it was like never in any order. Sometimes it was like scribbled in the progress notes. So I went through all of the pages and trying to trying to find as much of the data as, as I possibly could, and uh, I also the the so everything from the cancer diseases hospital was uh, paper. They had no electronic um, data. They had a database that they, they started uh, not too long ago, but uh, the the quality was I think a little bit unreliable. Uh, they were, they had different people inputting the data, and they all seemed to. At, take it from different locations, so I thought it'd just be safer for me to go through and have give them a well, complete data set at the end. And then the HIV database was a very nice electronic database, um, or so I thought at the beginning. Um, so the, the variables that I extracted from the CDH were age, residence, occupation, any comorbidities, um, uh, their labs, like creatinine, uh, any... If, if, if it was available, CD4, um, their full blood count. Uh, cancer treatment information included uh, their um, prescriptions, so like the dosages, how many, uh, whether they were pres prescribed uh, radiotherapy, um, chemotherapy, um, their end date and start dates for both uh, external beam radiation and uh, brachytherapy. So it was a, a, all, as much information as it could possibly take on uh, their treatment information. And then also took um, the tumor response to treatment. This one was a little tricky uh, because um, all all the patients had an initial initial visit, and um, sometimes they would the, the oncologist would note the uh, the size of the tumor. So if that was available, I included I, I took that information. But I'd say maybe about half of them only had that information. Other than that, I I did every subsequent uh, evaluation of the tumor. Uh, post radiotherapy, so um, 
this is where it also got a little messy because uh, there was inc there was inconsistencies in when they did the evaluation. Sometimes they did it four weeks post radiotherapy, sometimes six weeks, sometimes three months, sometimes four months, and so um, rather than try and like set a date and then try and calculate the date every the, the time in between every time, I I just collected every evaluation of the tumor um, that was available, and so I I wrote down exactly what they what they said and then I categorized it into three um, uh, categories. Uh, the first one was uh, was not evaluated, so the patient was lost to follow up after their first visit um, or they just, uh, for some reason, the, the tumor was just never uh, evaluated after radiotherapy. Um, there was gross residual tumor, GRT, which uh, was if they had any uh, residual tumor after um, after radiotherapy, if they had a recurrent disease, uh, after after maybe a couple of months, um, and I had uh, anything that was indicative that there was still tumor present was categorized as that, and there was no residual tumor when, when the oncologist wrote good response, complete response, uh, uh, thing, things of that sort were categorized as uh, no residual tumor. And then from the HIV database, I took uh, their HIV status, which means uh, like whether they were positive or negative for the unknowns. Um, or take their CD4 count, viral load, uh, the treatment regimen um, to try and figure out uh, what, what if maybe within the HIV uh, positive population, if there's certain tr uh, treatment regimens that are uh, going to be pr likely uh, lead to a worse response or better response to treatment, if there was uh, any changes in regimen over the course of their uh, HIV treatment and treatment compliance, um, the the uh, the HIV database, they, they had a form that they would perform at every visit that the patient did. They called that was their compliance form, where they would see whether the patient had been taking out their medication. They would ask them in the last seven days, have you missed uh, a dose in the last week, have you, or in the last month, have you? Um, have you been picking up all your medication? Things of that sort to take all that stuff into account. And uh, this was the data linkage, and so I used first name, last name. Uh, their residence and their date of birth or age of diagnosis because it was I after a, a short while I figured out that it was very common for people not to not know their date of birth and so um, I used their age of diagnosis and I, I compared this data with the data in the HIV database and then I considered them a possible match if their the full name was uh, if it matched uh, their residence matched and the age was plus or minus five years. Um, then they were considered a possible match, and then uh, sometimes in the HIV database they'd have information regarding uh, comorbidities as well, and sometimes they include in there, oh, this person has uh, cervical cancer, they don't have cervical cancer, they have something else, and so then I would co consider them a true match. Um, so these are my very initial results. I finished uh, last week, I think it was Thursday, is when I finished a lot of this uh, collection, so I, I did a short uh, analysis. Um, so I, I was able to take out 537 records of the 828. Of the 828, about 10% uh, were records that were just completely missing, could not find them anywhere in the hospital. Um, about 12.5% were actually not early stage. They were stages three and four. They were they were mislabeled. And so that um, I, I noticed at first it was a it was it was coming up quite often, and so I spoke to a couple of the oncologists about why why this is the issue why, why it's an issue, and so uh, a lot of times when when they would record the stage of the patient, they would they would take the staging from the referring hospital, and the referring hospital a lot of times they didn't have a very well trained uh, gynecologist, and so they would miss stage a lot of times. So they'd be stage uh, stage one in the referral form, and then they, when they would be seen. They'd be restaged at the CDH, and they would be found like you're actually stage four or stage three, and so that that was a, a fairly common uh, thing. And then another thing that I was uh, told by one of the oncologists, some of the oncologists, is that um, at some point, sometimes a, a junior uh, oncologist would come in and they do a staging, and then when the senior oncologist would check, and then they restage, and it'd be a later stage. Um, so that I came through a couple of times, and then uh, another twelve and a half percent. Um, was the just completely unknown uh, HIV status? So I didn't I didn't abstract their information. Uh, so the overall mean age was about 40, 48. Uh, the HIV po positive individuals uh, presented on average ten years earlier than the HIV negative. So it's forty two years versus fifty two, 
and uh, approximately 42% of the 537 are uh, HIV positive. And, um, and then of the patients who completed their first cycle of radiotherapy, about 27% had gross residual tumor. And then um, of those same patients who uh, completed that first cycle of radiotherapy, about 20% had progressive disease that, that resulted in uh, distant metastasis. And so some of the, the things I want to do is uh, I want to do com group, group comparisons to see any, any differences I may find between the uh, HIV positive and HIV negative individuals um, other than their HIV status, uh, uh, calculate the uh, five-year survival um, of the patients. Uh, they all have about at least five years. Um, some of them have up to nine years, but the, the patient in 2008 had a follow-up up until uh, some of them were seen earlier this year. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to also have to try and figure out how I'm going to handle some of the cases where they had appointments scheduled that they were seen last year, so I'll probably have to like inc maybe include their follow-up up until this year, kind of figure out how I'm going to handle that. Um, do uh, their time to recurrent disease, or uh, uh, progression-free survival, uh, their time to metastasis, and other factors that may contribute to, to disease recurrence. And so um, it was a really, really good learning experience. Um, it, it, like, really, international work is not easy. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, hoops you have to jump through to get in contact with the correct people, get the correct data. Um, there was lots of data limitations. I, I came with this huge list of variables that I wanted to get, and then I got there, I started looking through the files, and I was like, it's not going to happen. Um, there was a lot of inconsistencies in how um, the, the, the notes were taken. Some doctors had tons of information, some had very little information, and so I, I, w I spoke to some of the oncologists about possibly developing a form that would be required for everyone to fill out, and then additional progress notes. So we'll see if we can work with that. Uh, there was also, uh, in some areas of the hospital, it seems like there was a lack of uh, some trained individuals where they had maybe an IT person doing the work of an epidemiologist and uh, just because they knew some type of coding, they, they were in that position. And so it was a, that, that was a sem somewhat common. Um, I also learned that it, it's uh, like really okay to have limitations in, in the data and like you just kind of have to work with what you have and yeah. And so there was a, a ton of different things, I think, that can be done at the CDH. Um, so w one of the things that the oncologists were really interested in is expanding the study to include stages three and four, and that could help make decisions as to whether they should seek maybe more palliative care, whether they should continue uh, doing radiotherapy, because there was some concern about uh, they, they might have been uh, using these resources and it not really panning out for them and maybe just it, it increase their suffering for, for no reason and they could have done palliative care. Um, there's a, I think a, morta a cancer mortality study would be very useful as well. They've, um, they've had a lot of uh, issues handling their mortality data and building a mortality database. Um, pediatrics mortality is another one. Um, they just uh, received the pediatric data from uh, another hospital, so that's another thing that they could really use help on. Um, there's a, the social worker was very interested in doing something with perhaps social economic status and trying to figure out how to, how to say what social economic status is in that situation and how to quantify it um, and how that would uh, result to, or how that affects um, cancer treatment outcomes. And then reasons for loss to follow up is another huge one. Um, I, I didn't abstract the data from the, uh, the, the unknown HIV uh, patients, but I did look through some of the files that when I was looking for the, the HIV status, and I noticed that a big chunk, maybe about half, maybe more of the patients that had no HIV status were um, files that maybe had one page in them, one or two pages, like they came the first day, maybe they were asked for the HIV test and then never came back. And so that I found, I think, was, uh, it'd be interesting to find, like, what, what, are, what these reasons are. And so the, the research site itself, I think, was um, great. Um, I think that they had some electronic data available, uh, which is good, but I mean, it just, it just really needs some, some work and kind of try and clean it up. Um, while I was there, they, they, were, they were migrating to another database, and hopefully that new database ends up working out better for them. Um, another good thing is um, all cases at the Cancer Diseases Hospital are histologically confirmed. Um, like that was a requirement for them to be seen there. So um, what all the records that you know they they have cancer, and so it, it makes it a little easier. Like you don't have to go through the file and figure out oh they don't actually have cancer. 
And then uh, the staff are great. They're really friendly. Um, everyone seems really eager to help. They're all, there's a lot of them are very motivated to do different research projects, um, especially some of the oncologists. They were very excited about me being there and had lots of um, ideas to, for, future, for future work. And like I said, the limitations and the inconsistency of some of the data that's collected. Um, and then the lack of communication in healthcare is uh, that like these different uh, healthcare sites have their own databases, but there's no communication between the databases. And so um, when I was uh, doing starting my linkage, uh, the the people at the with the HIV database were very excited because the Ministry of Health is looking to to start linking um, and the all the different databases to kind of figure out like the big picture of how their patients are being treated and everything. And so they were really excited about maybe uh, using uh, kind of what what me and the software developer worked on to maybe do linkages in the future. And so I, th this experience really helped me like, know that I'm, I'm in the right field and this is something I really want to do. Um, I, before this, I wasn't too sure if cancer was really something I wanted to do. And uh, now I know this is like something I, I really like. Um, uh, I, I think I, I like to focus on uh, infectious disease related cancers. Um, and definitely uh, going to pursue my a PhD. I'll be applying this this fall, and I know I want to focus on uh, special populations, whether they're abroad or here in the U.S. Thanks. And uh, this was uh, this is Mulele. He's uh, the previous chief student, and he was like the only reason I was able to do my project. He had all the great all the connections. He was a huge asset in that. Yeah. One of the lessons learned here, I was in Zambia the second time during the summer, and I asked Mario about his uh, schedule for uh, completing the work, and he said, I'm going to do the linkage next week, and uh, I'm going to finish my project. And uh, I didn't tell him that uh, next week doesn't mean next week. <laughs> and uh, after I left, uh, he and Molini emailed me and said, um, it's not working. Uh, the HIV registry does not want to release the data because uh, of unknown reasons. So I told Mulele, I know the unknown reasons. The unknown reason is that Mario is a foreigner and they don't want to release the HIV data to someone from outside the country. So having Mulele taking over of the data uh, swearing to God that he is going to be the one handling the HIV data, solves the problem, and, and we got the data. But uh, HIV is tricky, and, and uh, uh, giving IRB approval and okay doesn't mean it's final IRB approval and okay. When it comes to releasing the data, it's something else. So it was interesting. I think the future as well would be um, when Dr. Salman, when we spoke to the, the dean of the new dean of public health and. I think that would be really good for the future is uh, to do a partnership with them to have the local, maybe some local students do a portion of the project. That way, when the, the C student go, they like a lot of the foundations that are set, they maybe some of the IRB approvals, uh, like, like some of the, the data identification, record identification, things like that. And that would make things a little smoother, things for the students. We have so many opportunities. We visited, Bob and I visited the, the program of public health. Uh, maybe five years ago and they were part of the medical school now they are separate school of public health to make a separate school of public health is something that's uh, unbelievable but uh, I, I think there are opportunities for partnership with the school of public health having uh, uh, local students working with US students and uh, uh, I think it's it's a, a great opportunity also the CIDAS program that uh, Mario talked about, very impressive program about screening, and there are so many opportunities about linkage of the screening data with the cancer data. It's also another uh, opportunity. And rolling up the HPV vaccination next year. Yeah, well. Dr. O'Donnell. I was going to ask how, how well is HIV being treated in I think it, it's, it's pretty pretty good. Um, yeah, they, they, uh, they, they're, they have funding. Uh, yeah. They have a lot of funding. Um, they have and, a lot of programs. And it's electronic data, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah. They record 
the CD4 count, the response to treatment, the treatment given, everything. And it's a national database where you can look at patients from different parts of the country. Very impressive. Yeah. Dr. Wilson. I wanted to ask about the missing cases in the studies. You pointed this out, which is good. Um, ones that you couldn't study because you didn't have HIV data. Mm -hmm. Any guesses as to special characteristics that they may, they may have that might bias the sample that you have here? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I spoke to some of the oncologists of why why they would even be missing in general, and she said that um, it, and when they first had opened the hospital, a lot of the times they, it wasn't a requirement to have the, the um, HIV test, and so they would just take them as patients anyway, and then it wasn't until recently where they started saying, no, you have to have the, the test because it'll, it'll affect you, and they, they, they counsel them for about an hour on their first visit to let them know kind of what's going on. And um, so I thought, I thought it was weird um, that it, it wasn't in there. Um, and I didn't want to just assume, like, just because they've been followed for so long, like, they're HIV negative or something. Yeah, I mean, this is a third of, third of your study, so like, that's why I was raising it. The other question I had, um, so do you know anything about, or do you want to look into anything about non-cancer HIV positive and HIV negative people who you can compare? That I think would be really, really cool, and uh, the the data from the HIV data, database is, is very robust. And I think it would be like, the, the only issue with the, with that database was abstracting the information that we wanted. Like it was all there, it was just uh, the way they stored it was very weird, and so it took uh, myself and the software developer about a week and a half to try and figure out code to pull out the numbers that we wanted. But there's tons of really good information in there that I don't think they've really done very many studies on. But I think that would be really good. Those are projects for next year. I think that the uncommon malignancies that are increasing now in, in East Africa uh, with the treatment of HIV patients, with response to treatment, there is a different pattern of cancers now increasing in East Africa. And uh, it's, it's doable here because they, ha they have the electronic database of HIV treatment, which is not the case in Tanzania, for example. So I, I think this is a great opportunity for next year. Thank you, Mario.